148th contact. Monday, September 21, 1981, 7.21 p.m. Billy says you were apparently very busy last time, otherwise, it probably wouldn't have taken so long before you could come to a contact again. And Semiaza still seems to be absent. Quetzal says that is of correctness. For my part, I've worked out the division of work, and I was also very occupied with carefully reviewing the interests and life in the center, whereby I also came across certain things that should be called unpleasant. Semiaza is still absent and otherwise occupied, that is also true. It will still take some time before she can devote herself to her tasks here on earth again. Billy says then, can I receive the division of work today? Quetzal says yes. Billy says good, then first just tell me the disagreeable things of which you spoke. So only the things that are unpleasant. Quetzal says they are quite unpleasant. It deals with the keeping of domestic animals. Billy says then I can vividly imagine what will come of this. I have often lectured our people about this, but so far, it was completely pointless. Quetzal says that is known to me, but now listen primarily, the keeping of house pets must be criticized, and in particular, the cats play the leading role. The earth human being has already been keeping domestic animals since thousands of years ago, but at the beginning, he was sensible enough to accommodate them in suitable premises. In the time of the progression of civilization, however, the earth human being cared less and less about separating his domestic animals from the human living spaces, and thus, at last, he even let the animals find shelter directly in the human living spaces. In a quite special measure, the earth human being has changed the pets, cats, and dogs into residential animals, which means that he accustomed these animals not to live in residential buildings specifically arranged as animal facilities anymore but directly in the living spaces of human beings. This is not only extremely unsanitary but also extremely stupid and irresponsible, for just cats and dogs are the dirtiest and most illness causing house pets that are kept by human beings. Cats and dogs never belong in the living spaces of human beings because these premises must be left to humans alone. Cats are even much worse than dogs because cats are the largest receivers and carriers of disease. In contrast to dogs, these animals roam around even more in areas that are extremely toxic for human beings and sometimes even in contaminated areas and come into contact with many more sick animals of all kinds which carry bacilli, viruses, microbes, and bacteria, etc. that are dangerous for human beings. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that also the dog isn't dangerous for human beings in this regard, for in truth, this animal also roams around in areas that are health hazardous for human beings and comes into contact with other animals that carry dangers for human beings. Just with the dog, it is about 17% less the case than with the cat, but which actually makes no big difference. The largest carrier of illnesses and diseases among the non-domestic animals is the rat, which has already brought millions of deaths over the earth, like, for example, the plague, to which the populations of entire regions have fallen victim. But among the house pets, the cat takes first place and the dog takes second place, playing the same role. And as we know through our researches, the plague, for example, could have never raged in such a deadly manner if the earth human beings hadn't kept cats and dogs as house pets. About 59% of all plague victims of all times came to their end only because they had been infected by cats and dogs. Nevertheless, the earth person hasn't become wiser, even though well-known scientists of the earth warn over and over again against having dogs and cats as house pets inside the living spaces of human beings because these unclean animals are responsible for many illnesses in human beings. A wide range of influenza illnesses, for example, which newly appear over and over again each year in different variations, are introduced to human beings to a very large percentage by cats and dogs among the rest because these animals are the best carriers of the pathogen agents of these illnesses and are, as a rule, immune to them.
These are, however, those illnesses which often bring death to the earth human beings. But on the other hand, illnesses that have not yet been recognized up to now as infectious illnesses, such as rheumatism, are also rife among human beings. This illness, which is more widespread on the earth than any other illness, is due not only to colds and overexertion, etc., but it often originates from cats and dogs, through which vast amounts are transferred to human beings, namely through rheumatic pathogens in the form of hair and dirt as well as vermin, etc., who then begin to suffer from this very painful illness and waste away. According to our findings, about 16% of all rheumatic diseases appear solely through contracting them from cats and dogs. This is just an example because still many other and often very malicious illnesses will transfer to human beings via cats and dogs as well as other animals. And the keeping of these animals in the living spaces of human beings is also extremely dangerous for this when the people holding these animals are of the stupid and erroneous view that their animals are clean in every respect. This doesn't correspond to the truth because just these two house pets can never be kept so pure and clean that they would no longer pose a threat to human beings. We are very well aware of the earth human saying our animal is clean and disinfected, but this saying only testifies of the true stupidity and lack of understanding of the, the people concerned in reference to these animals, which can already carry pathogens on themselves that are harmful to human beings after about 24 minutes after a chemical disinfecting. This is also the reason why our own keeping of animals on error is uniformly handled in such a way that dogs and cats may only live in the wild or in special and very large enclosures, to which the human beings have no direct access. Already very early on, our scientists of the past recognized what pathogens these animals carry on themselves, which are dangerous for human beings, which is why they arranged appropriate measures for their keeping. Even on the earth these measures should have been taken because a lot of disasters with illnesses could have been avoided by this. Our previous researches show that a lot of illnesses could only appear on earth among human beings because they settled different animals directly into their own living spaces through their unreasonableness and completely misunderstood love for animals and were then infected by these. Thus, a total of 43% of all illnesses that have appeared among earth human beings trace back to the fact that human beings came into too close of contact with animals, which are completely different kinds of life forms than human beings and which need other areas of life as well as other nutrients. But the most evil thing that a human being can still do, in addition to the wrong love for animals and the wrong keeping of animals, is that the animals are very often treated like human beings, by what means also wrong, death-promoting and illness-promoting physical contacts take place. On this occasion, animals are touched by the hands, without these hands being cleaned afterward as soon as possible with water, etc., before they become moved to the face, nose, mouth, ears, eyes, or food, etc. But furthermore, we've found out that with the earth human beings, forms of animal touching appear, which are already nauseating, like when a human being leads an animal to his mouth and even kisses it, whereby toxic factors and especially infectious illnesses may appear. Allergic illnesses of a rather bad form are also frequent consequences, and in another place also tuberculosis and nervous disorders, which may occur along with other evils. Billy says so in accordance with your words, do you want to say that no pets at all should be kept in the human living spaces? Quetzal says you were already informed about that by Sfaf in your earliest youth, after which you then also behaved accordingly. Thus, your question is illogical, for you've known the truth and its connections since time immemorial. Billy says of course, but I'm not asking this for me, as though I didn't know this, but because your explanation is issued to all those who don't want to accept this, even though I've preached everything many times before. Quetzal says I understand yes. Pets should never be kept in human living spaces and also must never be treated, touched, or caressed like human life forms. This applies first and foremost to cats and dogs, which are the most malignant carriers of illness, 
but this also applies to birds that are classified as house pets, which are kept in cages in residential premises and are the third most dangerous. And this also applies to rabbits, turtles, weasels, and all other animals that are kept by human beings as pets in human living spaces. With that, I now suggest to you that you tell the group members that it is to be decided that no pets may be kept in your living spaces anymore. My analyses in reference to several group members in the center have shown that by cats, dogs, and birds, etc., which have their living space in residential premises of the center, already a number of group members and other residents have been affected and some have already indicated health disadvantages which can't be repaired by earthly means of medicine and which will assume even worse forms with increasing age. In a very strong manner, Engelbert has been attacked, as well as Cornelia, both of whom already show damages that can't be repaired again. The same applies to your wife and to the boys Atlantis and Methuselah, Maria, and the son Rolf. Jacobus is also included in this who already shows strong signs. Billy says aha. But still, he would never talk about this, even when I told him in each case that he shouldn't permit the cats to be on the table and beside his plate and head, once he has fed them a meal in each case. Quetzal says such unreasonableness avenges itself, but report my explanations to the group members. They should determine whether or not reason should prevail before unreason and hold it through a corresponding ordinal rule. Billy says unfortunately, in this respect, you don't know the stubbornness and unreason of our people. The least that will certainly be exclaimed is that they have already had their animals in the apartment for many years and wouldn't change this under any circumstances because these animals belong to them. Quetzal says so much ignorance and irrationality probably wouldn't be the case after all the statements I've made on the basis of our research. Billy says I think that I know our people better, my friend. The wrong love for animals is written in them much greater than reason and intellect. Just think of the differences I already had with Agapula and just because of the cats. There are people who would rather accept a miserable and painful death, a miserable, physical croaking, then allow reason and intellect to win. Quetzal says I know that very well, and therein, I still have to address something else which is also based on it. Still in reference to the keeping of pets in human living spaces, reason and intellect should still actually be predominant. And since I'm already talking about this, I would also like to address the other evil, which refers to the keeping and breeding of rabbits you strive to create a larger breeding of rabbits, which should be adapted to nature and its circumstances. But in the process, mistakes are made which are inexcusable and which again trace back to a wrong love for animals. As I have noted, the young animals are properly thrown into burrows by their mothers, as this is quite natural and normal. But after that, the irrationality of those who've held the responsibility for this work up to now already begins. Thus, after the young ones are thrown in, the cave often breaks open and refuse, etc. are removed from it, while also the cave becomes sealed from rain impacts, etc. at its surface with metal plates and plastics, which must necessarily be omitted if the animals are to become suited for nature again. It is just as wrong that shelters are built for the animals with all kinds of materials that also strongly prevent the animals from coming close to their natural way of life again. In addition, these shelters and protective buildings disfigure the landscape in such a way that everything already looks unsightly. Together with Patar, I have carefully examined these problems, and we are of the view that these distortions of the landscape must be removed as fast as possible and never be made again. Up to the date of your no longer soul shaping of the whole environment, everything worked very well. Everything was aligned in harmony and coordinated with one another. But now these disfigurements. Patar, like me, is angry about this and we hope that these disfigurements will also be removed beside the center as well as in the hill up there under the trees. We all feel jointly responsible for the layout, the beauty, and the harmony of the center, which is why we also insisted on the appropriate points being recorded in the statutes. But now, 
exactly these statute-given points have been violated with the disfigurement. But this must be changed, and indeed in the foreseeable future. We've also endeavored to make the responsible authority figures more friendly and yielding to you through impulses, which we also achieved to a certain extent, but this doesn't mean now that through irrationality and through a wrong love for animals and through a sense of disorder, everything should be called into question again. And with that, I am at the next point up to now, Cornelia has handled the breeding and supervision of the rabbits in her area of responsibility. But now, if this should continue to remain so, then she has to adapt herself into the regulations and also act properly in relation to the keeping and utilization of rabbits. And exactly for this, I have to address the following points. 1. The existing stock of rabbits has to be dissolved and replaced by effective farm animals. The animals available at present are absolutely worthless as farm animals because they have useless sub-varieties and mutations, which have arisen from the irrationality of the persons responsible. 2. The younger generation of the new and more valuable races has to be removed from their mothers after five weeks and be separated according to gender. Up to the age of three months, the animals separated according to gender, which should be marked according to their age, are to be kept in young animal pens, and then, after two more months, they should be kept in a large enclosure, separated according to gender. 3. The rabbits living in the large enclosure are to remain there for two more months, according to which they should then be arranged by way of utilization. But at the same time, it isn't right that individual animals are postponed or that the animals are protected as a result of a wrong love for animals. Once rabbits are moved into and maintained in outdoor enclosures, then these are capable of utilization after about five months. This is a time that must be strictly adhered to. This type of rabbit breeding exclusively serves for meat production, on which the earth human beings are still dependent in relation to food. Sentimental moods and wrong love for animals, however, are not only obstructive, destructive, and dangerous in reference to illnesses in humans and animals, but they also thwart the actual breeding and utilization. Not just Cornelia but also Engelbert must learn this and bring their erroneously developed false feelings under control. But if they don't do this, as well as some other group members, then it would be better for you if no more animals would be bred. Billy says I know, but what should I do against it? Quetzal says nothing, because only pure reason determines this. And to act according to this must be left to the fallible ones. If animals are bred in this manner, then the need for utilization must also be taken into consideration and this utilization must be carried out. The animals in your large enclosure have already become old over time because they should have been brought to utilization. Thus, the keeping of the animals has already become more expensive for you than the actual value thereof. Billy says however, this is thrown against the fact that only the winter fur could be used upon a slaughtering of the animals. Summer fur couldn't be sold. Quetzal says that is of correctness, however, the animals may no longer be kept and fed as the time of maturation requires. Such kinds of animals must be constantly supplied for utilization, no matter what season it is. On the other hand, I have attended to this important matter, according to your earlier information and have discovered that rabbit skins don't yield so much profit that are waiting until winter time and, thus, a longer feeding period would be justified. Those animals that have already been in the large enclosure for a long time must now be used by you, namely down to the last animal, and indeed, within the next few days. After that, new and suitable mother animals must be bought and be used for a new breeding, after which everything must then be handled in such a way as is necessary. And until this is done with the existing animals and until the attitude of the persons previously responsible for this has changed, I am not willing to mention any more elaborations of my work division plan, for it would be pointless for me to give orders if these would be rejected and ignored from the start. Billy says you mean to say that you won't hand over the division of work to me for the time being? Quetzal says that is of correctness. 
First, I want to see a success in that our instructions are followed, that the disfigurements of the landscape are repaired, and also that the remaining requirements in reference to rabbit breeding find their compliance in the right form. However, I would also like to see a success regarding the keeping of house pets, primarily that the group members sit on this very important point in order to assess it and make their respective and appropriate decision. Billy says you have very specific ideas about what needs to be done. So far, this is clear. I am just surprised that you suddenly place a must behind this, which has never been the case otherwise. Until now? It has always been said that this or that should be done. Quetzal says that is again of correctness, but about that, the following over the past years, we've had to learn and recognize that instructions and advice are only followed if we make demands, namely demands that must be carried out. Pure requests to the group members which are based on reason, so we realized, always remain without success. For this reason. We are now forced by the group members into the situation that we are only able to work together on a return basis, so in the way that we will only transmit our values to the group if the group members follow our instructions and advice, etc. in return. Billy says not bad. I think that's a very reasonable and fair deal. Quetzal says your understanding matches my expectations. Now, let's just hope that the group members also find that understanding. Billy says we will see I have doubts though. But what do you have now even further on the negative side? Quetzal says that which is objectionable, which I've mentioned. Other negative things aren't so serious because they will resolve themselves over time. As we determined, a lot has changed very much for the better among the group members over the last few months much, even very much of what we always had to complain about in the past has changed and turned to the better. The reason of the individual group members has improved, and finally, rather good progress appears. This gives rise to the hope that now, everything will, nevertheless, turn to the good and to the right form, even though it was no longer to be expected after all the years that only brought vicious rainfalls. Billy says you are surprised, who? Quetzal says we are all pleasantly and unexpectedly surprised, and we hope that it will now continue to be so persistent. Billy says I hope so, too. But now, Quetzal, I still have a problem because of the Zahar Center. You know that foreign persons were mistakenly let in there. Quetzal says additional words from you aren't necessary because I know the problem. In the next few weeks, we will conduct a cleaning and repair the damage. Billy says then I am calmed. How long will it still take until then? Quetzal says if time allows us, then this work will be done in the course of the next week or two. Billy says that is very good. Then another question have you now removed all of the wedding cake ships? Here you have a ship again, like the one you had when you scrapped the washboard ships. Quetzal says they are all gone, yes, and we won't use them again. Now, we use the old ships again, into which all the technical innovations were incorporated, which were also in the latest models. Billy says aha, and these are resistant to our atmosphere. Quetzal says that is of correctness. The last aircraft, which you call, wedding cake ships and which actually do show a resemblance to such sweet food of the earth, were made out of a special alloy, which was adapted to the earth's atmosphere most exactly and which could only move in this one. Through the atmospheric changes, however, they slowly became destroyed and unusable. Billy says you explained that to me once. But how is it now with the photos that I actually still wanted to take but which I didn't manage to do because on the one hand, I had too much work at home and, on the other hand, because I was constantly besieged by certain night watches. Can I at least still take some shots of these old ships, and above all, is it still possible that I can make another series of photos of energy combustions? Quetzal says that is permitted to you, of course. Billy says that's good. Most of all, I would like to have one more series of shots of energy combustions just above the ground, 
like the ones I was able to make recently in the parking lot at the center. I think that they have become wonderful shots. You know, it's really fantastic as I stand in such a way in the middle of the energy combustion ring. Thus, our people can look at everything that I can experience together with you or through your help. Images demonstrate much more than I could ever describe in words. Quetzal says this is clear, but now, you should go back because I still have to do something, with which I am time bound. Billy says of course, ah, do you see Engelbert down there? How would it be if you'd let me appear down there in the middle of the beam on which he works so right in front of his nose? Quetzal says that he's too dangerous, my friend. Just think of the incident in Winkel Riot and Wet Sycon, when you materialized in the middle of the peak of a weather fur. Billy says nevertheless, that was really funny and, so to speak, an emergency landing. Quetzal says for your sense of adventure, certainly, but not for us. I will set you down in the middle of the meadow and handle it in such a way that Engelbert will immediately see you in the materialization, if you are so eager to surprise. Billy says okay, then just don't. By the way, I am to greet you warmly for him. Quetzal says for which I am grateful and reciprocate the greeting. You can also include all other group members in this. Billy says thanks, they will certainly be happy. By the way, I would still like to thank you for your sensitivity today at noon. At 3.30 p.m. comma I should have come to the contact, but because you saw that the Indian medicine man Philip Deere, medicine man of the Muscogee Indians and a member of the Indian Council of Elders, who died on the 16th of August 1985 was with me for a visit and that his conversation meant a lot to me, you set me aside for later. I don't actually get to see a real live Indian medicine man in the center every day, and especially not one with whom I can talk so well. Quetzal says it was a pleasure for me, and besides, this man also brought you good insights. Billy says yes, it was really fantastic car, you listened in? He told me about the religion of his people, which agrees in very many things with the truth. Quetzal says I wouldn't have had to listen in because I analyzed the man and knew with whom I was dealing. Nevertheless, your conversation was very interesting. Billy says thanks, I thought so too. Then let me exit now. Quetzal says you do, indeed, know your own method of exiting very well just drop into the void probably for the thrill. Billy says how right you are. I'm just waiting for the moment when the dematerialization machine fails once and I whistle as fast as a stone down to the earth. Then, I would like to see how quickly you'd react and how you'd make it that I don't slam hard into the ground. Quetzal says your humor is often very difficult to understand, not in the least because you know very well how to intertwine humor and reality just like now, because you joke and, at the same time, actually hope for such a situation. But I'm sorry to tell you in this regard that it would be impossible for you to jump into the dematerialization hatch if this could fail, but that will certainly never be the case. An energy field would hold you back before the opening. Billy says aha, but now, if even that would fail. Quetzal says you are relentless, but that is absolutely impossible. Billy says really absolutely? Quetzal says absolutely. Billy says then it would probably be that way. By then, my son, and come back soon. Greet your people from Yorso Patar, Semiaza, Playa, and Manara and all others. Quetzal says I'll just wait and see what arises from what I've explained to you. Until we meet again. Billy says by then. The end.